so today I'll be talking about I'm the, uh, my name is Carolyn Rodriguez. I'm the director of the um, a translational OCD group uh, here at Stanford. And um, the work that I do is really uh, focused on those individuals who are not helped by first line treatment and have tried a lot of different things or just kind of looking to see what's new, what's out there. Um, one of the challenges in our field is that for every 11 compounds being tested in oncology and every eight in neurology, only one is being tested in psychiatry. And some of the limitations for drug development um, involve being able to understand the, the brain basis uh, for, um, for our um, uh, conditions that people face. And I like to think about it as... Um, you know, trying to uncover and piece from working backwards from behavior, what's happening at a neural network level, at a circuit level, how do these different brain regions speak to each other, and then at the most fundamental receptor uh, level. So looking at um, neurochemical messengers in the brain and thinking about sort of the basic biology. And we do that in, in our group by partnering with um, uh, translational researchers and um, looking at animal models for compulsive behavior, testing novel compounds, and, and then testing those uh, compounds which are promising in individuals with OCD. And as you'll hear from uh, Dr. Williams and, and, and uh, Dr. Lee as well, um, we have um, different kinds of circuit neuromodulation that we can do. So one, one level up from receptors. And you can use things like transcranial magne uh, magnetic stimulation um, and deep brain stimulation. So Dr. Lee is gonna be talking about that in his work at UCSF. Um, and so, you know, what I'm gonna focus on today is just speaking to you about the psychopharmacological receptor level. Um, we know, as you heard already uh, from others, medications and CBT help about half of individuals, maybe more with CBT um, and my work really focuses on uh, this converging line of evidence that OCD is suggested with a hyperactive um, loop, um, which is uh, comprised of the front part of the brain, the orbitofrontal cortex, and important for generating thoughts, the striatum, which is important for generating behaviors, to the thalamus and, and circling back. And my research focuses on glutamate. I know there's been several questions today. It's the main excitatory chemical messenger in the brain that cells use to communicate with one another. And it's thought that too much glutamate um, uh, release may lead to hyperactivity. And I was really interested in how, um, how glutamate, um, how we can think about and understand um, how glutamate works um, in the brain. And I, I ran across um, a study by Welsh et al looking at the SAPAP family of proteins that form this complex between the neurons um, at these excitatory glutamatergic synapses. And when um, researchers and animal models um, uh, knock out uh, that, that uh, protein, you can see the successive grooming behavior. And when they add that protein back in, in the striatum, one of these regions that's important for OCD, it rescues um, that compulsive behavior. So this really intrigued me um, and um, I wanted to understand how can we modulate um, the effect of glutamate in the brain and ketamine at the time that I was studying it had just um, had a really cool replication study from NIH showing rapid relief of depression um, in, in uh, relief of uh, uh, symptoms of depression with a single ketamine infusion. And we want, went on to do a small pilot study um, showing, uh, you know, very rapid uh, decrease for those individuals that were randomized to ketamine um, after a single IV infusion of ketamine. So on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being constant intrusive obsessions, it was really remarkable to see that within hours, people didn't have these obsessive thoughts. And even long past the metabolism of, of um, ketamine, individuals continued to have benefits. And half of individuals that got ketamine, again, in the small pilot study, um, experienced um, uh, uh, symptom relief that would categorize them as a responder. And individuals were, um, you know, felt as if a weight of OCD has been lifted. They couldn't have OCD thoughts during that time. 
But one of the downsides of ketamine is that it has side effects. Um, people felt dissociated. There's mild transient changes in blood pressure. One person had nausea and vomited. So while we were really excited about, you know, uh, ketamine um, and uh, that this very rapid uh, response when, when individuals were not on other SSRI. So it was really the first time this kind of new mechanism um, uh, 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 purported to to ketamine could um, you know ha have have some uh, uh, some benefit um, was highlighted in terms of glutamate modulation. Um, but there there's reasons for caution. The effects are, are transient. Uh, their side effects. Ketamine is also called special K. It's a substance of abuse. Um, but could we use ketamine as as a tool to sort of further understand what is happening in the brain and how we can better optimize ketamine. Um, for treatment. And so we um, next collaborated with um, uh, a colleague that Dr. Lee knows from UCSF, Lisa Ganadin, um, to partner and see if we could kind of do the same experiment, but in an animal model that I just talked about, the SAPAP3 knockout mice, in which in, um, the mice were um, injected with ketamine or saline. And you could actually see and quantify um, grooming uh, behaviors um, in the same time course. And what we found, um, uh, um, and uh, this is work done in uh, Lisa Gunnedin's lab um, with her um, postdoc, um, that uh, when they um, had the, the knockout mice at baseline had this grooming bouts that were very, very high compared to the wild type. And then when they got the infusion of ketamine, which is this dashed line, there was a, a very quick decrease uh, in symptoms that was uh, significant. And then um, Lisa went on to do a really amazing set of experiments um, using uh, very cool optogenetic tools and testing to see the ketamine increases activity in this area called the dorsomedial prefrontal um, these neurons that were projecting to the striatum, um, that when they used light to mimic this increase in frontostriatal activity, it reduced grooming in the knockout mice. And conversely, um, inhibiting the circuit um, increased grooming. And then when they were able to kind of do these things together, ketamine blocked uh, the exacerbation of grooming caused by optogenetically inhibiting frontostriatal activity. So long way of saying is that these experiments demonstrate that, that indeed ketamine increases activity in these frontostriatal circuits in an animal model. And that uh, you know, uh, causally controls compulsive grooming behavior, suggesting this circuit is important for ketamine's therapeutic um, effects in OCD. And future research, um, involves partnering with Carlos Zarate at NIH. We're funded by the International OCD Foundation to test RRHMK, which is a uh, metabolite of ketamine that um, doesn't have the same um, you know, uh, effects, uh, the, the unwanted effects uh, the ketamine produces. And as well, um, we uh, just finished an NIH-funded study, ran a larger study of the one that I just showed you, where Individuals are randomized to ketamine and midazolam. It's a control condition. And we're looking at um, using uh, imaging to look at changes in neurochemical messengers to see if indeed that is um, uh, a way in which uh, ketamine is working. So really excited to um, see again um, if, this, if, the, if those findings were replicated. And if so, could we uh, determine markers, biomarkers that could tell, um, you know, who, who may be um, uh, responders or not responders uh, to uh, this treatment uh, proactively. I also want to highlight um, a new study um, you just heard from Dr. Van Rossel. He is doing a study looking at nitrous oxide in OCD. Um, it's funded by uh, NARSAD, the Brain Behavior and Research Foundation. It is a gas um, that uh, sort of follows on these principles of looking at glutamate. So it is a glutamate receptor antagonist, um, they, but may also lack ketamine's um, effects. Um, and what's nice about nitrous oxide is that it's a gas, it's a, 
uh, used in dental procedures. It's also called laughing gas, um, safe and well tolerated and has a very rapid off effect. So if you take something like ketamine, you can't drive for 24 hours. But if any of you have gone to the dentist and gotten uh, nitrous oxide, you know that you're back to baseline very quickly. You can leave from the dentist's office. So it's more, more convenient and it may be a more feasible and more tolerable alternative uh, to ketamine. So if you're interested in partnering on this research or finding out more, just email us at ocdresearch at stanford.edu. And the last study I'll highlight is um, an agglutamate modulator called Trorilluzol. We are a site in this uh, Biohaven uh, study. Um, it is, uh, you may have heard of a drug called Rilluzol. Um, this drug is an improvement on Rilluzol. So I like to see that. Um, it it uh, is only single dosing. You can take it with or without food. Um, it's an add-on. So if you're on an SSRI medication, you can add this on. We participated in the phase two studies that were promising enough to give, to give the green light from the FDA to do a large multi-site phase three study. So it's national and international. Um, and if you're interested in, in um, you know, if you haven't quite gotten enough symptoms uh, reduction with your current medication, please contact us again at ocdresearch at stanford.edu. Um, I see that I'm, I'm, I'm right at time, but I'm just going to give you a peek. Uh, I promise to talk a little bit about psychedelics and where we are in the field, and I'll just highlight uh, two of them. Um, you may already know, and if not, uh, you know, there are different kinds of psychedelic uh, medications. So there's classical, atypical, antactogens, dissociative, and cannabinoids. And each of them have different mechanisms and effects on cognition and emotional relatedness. And um, the one that, you know, there, there isn't very much literature on, on um, uh, psychedelics and OCD. In, in OCD for psilocybin, this has um, you know, really intriguing findings uh, by Leonardo and Rappaport describing um, decrease in OCD symptoms. There's an open label study by Moreno et al. showing improvement at 24 hours. And um, there, uh, um, uh, Chris Pittenger and Ben Kalmendi at Yale are doing a study um, at, at Yale right now. And I know Ceruvia um, is a drug company that will be doing a multi-site study of psilocybin and OCD, and we're going to be um, a study site uh, for that study. So stay tuned. Um, there's a need for caution. And I think uh, it kind of goes without saying that these are, um, you know, these studies have been done in controlled settings. You need to do careful monitoring um, and, um, you know, that you can have negative experiences in, in uncontrolled uh, environments. For more information, I'll put in the chat. Uh, we recently did an APA review of psychedelic therapeutics. It provides a nice review of where the psychedelic field is. Um, the, the bottom line is that there's insufficient data for FDA approval of any psyche, a psychedelic compound for routine clinical use at this time. Um, but um, there is really cool, exciting data in MDMA um, and psilocybin and treatment of depression um, that has deemed, FDA has deemed um, breakthrough uh, therapy. And finally, MDMA um, is uh, another drug that you may have heard of. Um, just uh, Mitchell et al. Uh, published a, a really nice phase three study um, showing um, nice reduction in PTSD will be support for the, for the uh, FDA application. And what do we know in OCD? Nothing. There's no studies to date, uh, but I'm happy to report, and this is where I'll end, that we um, have new funding from the foundation from OCD Research to launch an MDMA OCD study in collaboration with MAPS. And again, that's launching. It'll take a while to get, get things up and going, uh, but feel free to reach out to us um, if you're interested. All right. So I want to thank the lab and um, really want to thank all of you.